Good afternoon and welcome to the FEMA Region 2 Individual and Community Preparedness Webinar Series. My name is Allison Albright and I'm going to provide a few technical considerations before we begin. Today's proceedings are being recorded and captioned. The archived event will be available on the FEMA website in the coming weeks. You should hear audio through your computer speakers, so please ensure your volume is turned up so we hear the proceedings accordingly. In the top right corner, we ask if you'd like to receive news and updates from Region 2. If so, please enter your email address and we'll be sure to add you to the distribution list. We will have a question and answer session after the presentation concludes. You'll see a Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner. Please feel free to submit your questions about the subject matter there. and time permitting, we'll do our best to answer them. Finally, the PowerPoint presentation from today will be available for you to download and the file share pod as a PDF. You can click on the file and download it using the download button. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the Region 2 Community Preparedness Officer to introduce our speaker and today's proceedings. Did you know that FEMA's number one goal is to build a culture of preparedness? The Region 2 Individual and Community Preparedness Program is focused on preparing individuals and communities for disasters by providing useful information and training inspiring people to act and be ready for any emergency. Good afternoon. I'm Debbie Costa, the Community Preparedness Officer for FEMA Region 2. On behalf of our team working to strengthen preparedness across New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, I'd like to welcome you to our preparedness webinar series. As part of FEMA's number one goal, we're pleased to be hosting today's webinar, Powerful Presentations, Delivering Well-Crafted Answers the third and final webinar in a series on powerful presentations. The goal of this webinar series is to provide training on techniques to improve public speaking skills on emergency management topics. Each session will take a deep dive into a presentation element, and our third and final session today will focus on skillfully addressing questions. Our presenter throughout the series is Thomas Song. He has been practicing the oldest profession in the world, sales, for 25 plus years. For more than half that time, he worked on Wall Street using improving sales techniques and relationship management strategies. He joined FEMA in 2010 and has led Region 2's outreach on flood hazards. Thomas uses principles in selling to win over indifferent or skeptical audiences. He has also served as a communications coach, developing training to help emergency managers influence the behaviors of decision makers and the public. Thomas, the stage is all yours. Thanks, Deb. So gifts, who doesn't like gifts? And sometimes you can t think of questions from an audience as a gift. It indicates that A, they may be interested, B, they want to learn more, but more importantly, it's giving you some kind of insight into what they're thinking. Right? We cannot read the minds of our audience, but when they give us that window where they share something with us, we should take the most of that opportunity. But oftentimes, people think of the question and answer exchange, they, they kind of take it for granted, as if when the question is asked, just answer it. Well, there's so much more that you can do with that, and today we're going to go over that. And we have a volunteer, Frank Ferrant, he's a New York City CERT. We're going to go a little bit over uh, some of his responses. And you as an audience want you to participate and really work through not just what he has to say, but some of the things that you would normally say or handle the situation. And hopefully we will all learn together. Now, before I begin, I want to get into an example of blowing an opportunity to kind of take that question and making the most of it. Allison, can you start the video, please? Barbie is getting, for the first time in 20 years, a new face, and Rapunzel is featuring that new face. Ah. It's a fresh new look with a more natural makeup. Oh, I see, so her, so, okay, she's not smiling, so her teeth don't show. I mean, she's sort of smiling, but with a closed mouth. Okay, so she does look different, lighter makeup. But this one is not the one with the new bod, right? Throughout the year, we'll be introducing new Barbies. In fact, every time you see her, she'll look just a little bit different. 
Later in the year, we will introduce a new teen segment that will feature a body that is more teen-like. Which is what? Smaller? Mm -hmm. What? Really rad will feature a new look for Barbie. It will have a slimmer figure and the most coolest, hippest, up-to-date look with hipster jeans and a hairstyle that's brand new for Barbie. Okay, but to, to get really technical, she's getting smaller <laughs> breasts and smaller hips, right? And a bigger she waist. Really Rad will be a doll featuring a new body, but throughout the year we'll have many different new looks for her. Okay, but here's what all the women in America want to know. If you're going to update Barbie's look to make her look more realistic, thighs maybe, bigger hips maybe, but, but you're making her skinnier. Barbie will have definitely a great new look that in the Really Rad segment is... is <laughs> okay, okay, you're... you're, 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 you're uh, your point is taken. You, this is going to be a hip, young Barbie with great new clothes, but still smaller lips. Many of us are hoping that cellulite Barbie hits the shelves sometime. <laughs>
and they feel even stronger about their position. And that becomes very difficult. That becomes difficult as a speaker to overcome. And so oftentimes we are throwing some rational argument. You know, we use science or we use data, and yet it doesn't move the needle, and we're surprised. So instead of doing the same things and not getting the results we want, I really want you to think about how do you touch upon people emotionally? Put the rational aside. We've tried that. Combine it. Mix it. How do you get them? How do you make a message resonate deeply within somebody? How do you get their guard down? These are very, very difficult things to overcome, and we've talked about them in the last two sessions, and we'll talk a little bit more about it now in the context of answering a question. And then you have cognitive dissonance. This is often, uh, this is when people have two or more viewpoints on one particular topic. They're usually in conflict. Should I or should I not? Do I want to do this? It's bad for me. I don't want, I shouldn't do it. And oftentimes these conflicts create dissonance or discomfort or pain. And so we as human beings, we don't like to be uncomfortable. So we have to kind of pick a side and go with it. You know, people call it justification or being in denial. These are all things that really describe what we go through. And so understanding that when we try to bring something, when we try to bring a message across to an audience, who may feel differently. For them to accept or listen or give you some type of credence, it causes them discomfort. And so we need to be very careful how we deliver our message. Not necessarily the content, but in the way that we share it. How do we make it relevant to them? How do we not become confrontational? And in fact, just be more of a guide so that it isn't something that is met with hostility or opposition, or they close their minds off. Again, we'll go over that today in the context of how, when you're answering a question. Not only do we have these biases, but our brains don't operate the way we may think they do. You know, we often think of ourselves as pretty, pretty rational people. We're smart enough. We juggle the, the options in front of us. But Daniel Kahneman, he's a renowned uh, researcher in behavioral science, he wrote this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It is an excellent read, easy to understand, and very, very interesting. So I would highly recommend this book. But he breaks down our thinking process into two systems, system one and system two. System one is the thing that uh, our mind works without really giving it a lot of effort. Now, the things we know, two plus two, four. We don't think about it, and in fact, it becomes very reactive. And system two is a lot more deliberate. You know, it's the 158 times 60,000. It takes a little time for you to, your brain to process that. And what he's discovered is that people mostly like to let their system one manage their thinking. The, the brain is kind of lazy. If system one is fast and reactive and you have an answer, fine. And then the brain relies on that. But when we have some complicated or issues or topics that we want to get across that are not so simple, that do require a lot of thought, we need to be very cognizant that we can't just be uh, very blasé about it. But we need to make sure that we are sharing information in a way that is understandable. Not that we understand, but that the audience does. So as speakers, always put your audience first. Don't think about yourself. Now, so in this book, he has a lot of great examples. And one of the examples he uses of this system one and system two, and please use your chat box. I want to ask everybody a question. Again, I went over the two plus two. I know everybody knows that answer. And then he asks the question, a bat and a ball cost $1.10 together. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Please, in the chat box. If everyone could just put in an answer, that would be great. So we're getting $0.10. Cents. We're getting $0.05, cents, $0.10. Cents. 
10 cents. And this is normal. Our brains just take these numbers and we don't really give it a lot of thought. But here's the real answer. It is 5 cents. And as you see, if the ball costs 10 cents and the bat is a dollar more than the ball, well, the bat would have to cost a dollar 10. And therefore, that total would be 120. And this isn't because you're uneducated or you're not smart. It's because that system one just takes over. It hears a dollar, a dollar ten. What's the difference? And yet, if you really give it more thought, it's not really what the question was asking. And so this is something that we need that can trip us up as speakers. Is when we're trying to get something across, we're thinking people are getting it. But the way they're absorbing your inf the information you're sharing may not be taken the right way. Their system one could be activated. They're getting key points and then kind of making assumptions on what those points are that you're sharing, and they come to their own conclusion. And that becomes a challenge for us. Like I said, what we deal with is so important that we need to make sure that there are no misunderstandings. Right? There are no misconceptions. We need people to get the facts. We need people to get the, the message we're getting across because it could be a matter of life and death for them. So it's important to just be prepared. When you go into an audience or when you're speaking in front of people, do your research. Have your talking point. Research the relevant information. Understand your audience. Just like the COVID response, there are areas in New York City that uh, are heavily with people who are very religious or with different cultures. And the message can't be the same for each because each group, each person have their own priorities. They have their own way of thinking of things. And for you to have a blanket approach and say, well, here are the facts and everyone should just get on board we see that that does not work. And we need to make sure that we are tailoring our approach as well as our content to our audience. And when, so when people are asking questions, that is another opportunity for you to take your message and maybe change it a little bit depending on the question. Because again, if that question provides you insight into the way that they're thinking or the person is thinking, that can help you pivot, make changes at the last minute, and restate your message in a different way. At the very least, you'll be answering a question. But at the very most, you can now have a way of saying, hmm, maybe I should try it a little bit differently to make this message resonate more. One of the other things you should think about before you speak is when you want to take questions. Some people, don't like to be interrupted. Some people don't mind. That is totally up to you. But let the crowd know. Let your audience know. Hey, feel free to ask a question at any time or make moments, put spots in your presentation where you take the time to uh, ask people for questions. What happens very often is during these presentations, people wait until the very end to have this Q&A and just end it there. What I strongly suggest is ending every presentation with some closing remarks, preferably a call to action, kind of a reminder of why everybody was there to begin with. Because when you end in a Q&A, you're kind of ending your whole presentation, everything you've worked on, from somebody else's words or viewpoint. You spent a lot of time on your presentation. You have an important message. End on your own words. Let people walk away with the last thing they heard, the ideas or the messaging or the mission that you're trying to accomplish should come from you, not from others. And here's some of the things that to be really kind of aware that you should avoid at all costs. They're pretty simple, but I'm telling you, it happens. And sometimes you get caught up in the moment. You know, you're, you're in a small room, and when somebody is angry and they're loud, and they start shouting, it's amazing how everybody else starts to shout, including yourself sometimes. We have to be 
very objective as speakers. We have to understand our audience. We don't need to inflame anything or make things worse. In fact, we need to cool people's uh, heads. We need to cool their tempers because when people are angry or upset, they're not going to listen or give you an opportunity to, to explain yourself. So there are things to do not to trigger them. Some of the things that I've, I've seen or some of the things I've done myself, someone starts to ask a question. And I finish it for them. That is just very disrespectful, and that's going to make somebody, again, think that, uh, you know, they may not want to hear what you have to say. Or you answer a question when you don't really understand. There's nothing wrong with asking somebody to repeat themselves. Better yet, a you know, really nice trick is repeat the question yourself. And if you can, use your own words or try to explain, try to use your own words to kind of describe their question. That makes people feel like, wow, you as a speaker, you, you were listening to them. Everybody likes to feel appreciated. Everyone likes to get a degree of respect. And that can go a long, long way for an audience to keep an open mind. Now, in this remote environment that we're in, the body language becomes a little more different. Uh, in the in-person meetings, your body language can speak tons about you. It can also be a distractor. It can keep people away. It can keep people from asking you questions. And so try to be conscious of it. And there are certain things that, little things, that people can actually pick up on that you may not be aware of. One of the things uh, I've seen and someone demonstrated was the palm. You know, when you see palms like this, it looks defensive, as opposed to the open palm. Looks more inviting. And there are little cues. And, and on a personal note, so when I was doing some more, uh, when I was developing communication workshops, me and a couple other instructors, we used to record ourselves. So I did a recording, I'm watching it, and what I realized is that I had RBF. Now, I don't want people to type what that is, but it's resting face. In other words, I had a scowl on my face when I wasn't talking. And I was thinking, wow, that's just not good for a speaker. I'm telling people to watch their body language, and here I am with this scowl, this, this kind of look that just has made me look very unpleasant. So I'm on my way home. I'm Googling how to smile more, how to uh, improve my body language facial expressions, etc. I pick up, hey, practice. Practice, practice, practice until you get used to it. So I spent the rest of that commute smiling, forcing a smile. I get home. I open the door. My wife looks at me. And she's like, what the hell's wrong with you? I said, I'm smiling. And she said, why? I said, I'm trying to improve my demeanor, that my nonverbal communication. And she told me to stop because it was freaking her out. So the lesson learned was if your significant other or your friends or anyone you know says you smiling freaks them out, maybe that means you should be smiling a little bit more. One of the other things we do in the easy way of answering questions is we just take what's asked and we answer it. But do we really understand what? the core question is. What was underneath that question? And so uh, there is some great research out there to talk about not only understanding what is said, but trying to glean what is behind it. What's the motivation behind it? So in other words, look deeper into what's being asked and ask them. It's OK to ask questions to someone who is posing a question to you. Get to that core issue. Because if somebody says, hey, you know, if they ask you a simple question and you answer it, they may not be satisfied or you may not have taken advantage of that situation so that you could have answered the deeper issues or the deeper question that they may not be sharing with you. Try to understand what's the motivation behind that question. If you're not sure, ask. But if you can touch upon that, 
you address those core issues, that person will feel that much more satisfied. And in fact, they'll feel like you've really answered their question fully as opposed to just getting that superficial answer. And like that smiling exercise that I was doing, practice. And not so much answering questions, you don't really know what's going to come at you, but practice your message. How is it that you can say something very concisely, but yet be impactful? And practice being natural at it, because you never know when it comes up. And so one of the things that always happens is, you know, sometimes you get put in a position where you might be at a loss for words. There's always ways to get back to your message. And we're going to get into that in the second half. How do you bring it back to, the, to what you want to say? Politicians do this very often, and, 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 uh, you know, and I don't mean that in a very negative way, but we're going to get into that. How do you take a question that may either put you in a bad position or that you don't have the, the, the answer to because it's an impossible question, but you still make the most of it by bringing it back to your message. But when you have that chance, make sure that when you do say your message, that you're, you have it prepared. You know, it, it's not, people think that it may sound robotic. If you do it well enough, you'll be surprised. And it gets you out of many jams. It makes you sound like a very confident speaker. And it's also a great way of really getting your point across. So there are really four ways to answer any question. And we're going to get into each one of these. It, uh, in the second half, we're going to go into a little bit more detail, but I wanted to bring this up because we're going to have Frank come up next, and we're going to have Frank take on the first one, the response, the directly answering the question. Frank, are you on? Yes, I am now. Okay. Great. All right. Frank, can you turn your camera on, please? Uh, give me a second. Uh, can you see me? I can see you, Frank, and we hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Great. So, Frank, you want to just introduce yourself to the group? Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Frank Ferenc. I'm a uh, CERT from New York City. I'm in uh, Manhattan Division Three, which is the uh, Upper East Side, Midtown, and Roosevelt Island, which is where I live. Uh, and at present... I'm out at the uh, Staten Island uh, COVID uh, pod point of dispensing uh, on Staten Island, Staten Island Technical High School, and we're taking 1,600 clients today and 1,600 shots. Okay, excellent, Frank. All right, so now I just want to address the audience for, for a second. Uh, what we're going to have Frank do is Frank's going to do a very short presentation on something that's relevant to what he's doing now. Uh, and this has to do with COVID, uh, COVID vaccination. And what I would like the group to do is to, to think of some questions to ask him. Now, I don't want these to be the, the impossible questions like, hey, um, you know, uh, is the vaccine, I heard the vaccine's made out of spider blood or something like that. You can ask him difficult questions, but uh, I want you to think of think something that he can respond to directly. Then Frank will give his response. And then we're, kind of go, we're going to go over his answer as a group, provide some positive uh, feedback, and see are there, is there an opportunity to make that answer better, how are, how are there different ways of handling it, et cetera. So uh, and I, I'll, I shouldn't have to repeat this because everybody's been so great, but I, I want to. Um, just everybody, please be professional, be respectful. We all understand how hard it is to get in front of a group. Uh, especially people you've never met, and be on the spot and talk. So uh, Frank's been uh, kind enough to, to volunteer this, uh, volunteer himself, and let's give him the respect that he's due. And Frank, uh, I will move the slides. Just let me know when. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the first slide shows this is a Staten Island Technical High School uh, in New York City. We have uh, 
specialty schools. This is uh, one of them on Staten Island. Uh, and this is where the pod, the point of dispensing is for the COVID vaccine. Uh, this is sort of giving you the upper, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, bird's eye view of it. And uh, th there's a street there that you see uh, that has sort of like an elbow. That's where we are. I'm actually in, the, in this building right now because we're doing pod vaccinations right downstairs and outside. So can you take the next slide, please? So this is more of a schematic view, which gives you a sense of really what's going on. So we have a waiting line, and people are waiting there. We have, you know, of course, NYPD and EMS, just in case. We have a lot of congestion with traffic, uh, people uh, wanting to get their vaccine. It's really jammed in terms of parking. You check in in the screening area. You walk around the building. You go into uh, the cafeteria, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, there's checkpoints, and then you exit, and you go out the other side of uh, the building. Uh, can you go on to the next slide, please? So this is what it looks like. This is a typical pod, which is you come in on one side. Uh, the nurses area, you wait at the head of the line. There's a nurses area there. They have paddles uh, that they show. They wave when they're ready. This way, no one's shouting. And after you get your vaccine, you're waiting in the post-injection area. You wait there 15 minutes. Uh, there are people coming around asking you if you're okay, checking on you, and also making your second appointment. You want to make sure you have your second appointment uh, in uh, if this is your first time, and then you leave uh, to the right. And so that's sort of an overview. Many of them are organized uh, similarly. Next slide. So this is us. Uh, that's the, uh, the site manager, Andy, uh, uh, in blue. Uh, I'm on the right there. You can see uh, PD is uh, on there. It's actually pretty busy. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to manage getting a lot of people in while keeping them safe. Uh, so six feet apart, and also getting them in fairly when their time slot is called. So uh, we make use of some line control techniques, but that's uh, we have to move people around once or twice and then finally get them into the building. But that's how it works, and uh, we do that from uh, the shots are from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., and we're, our shift is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay, great, Frank. And so I want the audience to really think, if you were one of these people, or if you were at his pod and, and you had a difficult question, I want you to think of a question and I want you to put it in the chat box. Um, and as we do that, and by the way, Frank, there are people here, uh, I don't know if you've seen the ch chat box, they're thanking you for your service. Uh, they're asking you, do you feel safe? You want to you wanna share that with them? Uh, sure. Well, you can see that I'm wearing a mask right now. Actually, I don't need to at this present moment because I'm in a gymnasium and we're able to take our masks off uh, I don't know if you can see here, uh, the, uh, this is a lunch area. The tables are very far apart, and so you're able to eat lunch without wearing a mask here. Normally, everything is PPE. Uh, we have, it's a no-contact environment, so everything is safe. We take all the precautions, sanitizing, everything safe, safe, safe. And part of that is to, uh, is to uh, get the public to comply with you outside, like the six feet and stuff. And, we all know how hard that is, but we, we do a pretty good job on it. We explain to them why it's necessary, and, and largely Great. they're compliant. Yep. Great. Great, Frank. All right, so Terrell has a question. Uh, why was parking included in the plan versus doing the job through shop? So if somebody is waiting online and, they, and Frank, they pull you over and they say, hey, how come we're not doing this through drive through it's so much, It would be so much more convenient. How would you answer that question? Uh, well, first of all, it, it turns out that we don't really have the place to do it at this location. There are some other locations elsewhere in the city. Uh, this one is more, there are two modes, pedestrian and vehicular. The pedestrian mode is the one we're using here, which is people walk up. The vehicular one, I believe, is used at some other locations where you sort of drive through. I don't happen to know uh, those locations, but that, that they do have them throughout the city. Okay, all right. So, audience, what do you, what do you think? Did, did you, were you satisfied with his answer? Um, do you think he did a good job? As, as uh, and Allison can look through the, the chat box, uh, but Frank, my initial thing is, look, I, I think you got a great demeanor. Yeah, um, you, you responded to that question. I thought that you did a great job. There's nothing about you. You seem very disarming. 
I think it's, it's just part of the, your, your, the way you speak very clearly. Uh, and I'm wondering, though, while it was a good question, you know, what do you think, um, what do you think you can get across to a person who asks a question? Obviously, they're not, you know, they're somewhat uh, taken aback by not being able to sit in their car. What well, I would say there are, well, there, are two, there are two messages that we want to get across, okay? Uh, so the first is safety on everything. That includes pedestrian safety, which most people don't think about. Ah, so we're very, very we're very mindful of that, okay? The second thing is people's health, which is the reason why when they come to the line, we ask them just to get on the line anywhere as long as they're six feet apart. And I would say then the third thing is fairness. So we walk down the line. So I'm, I'm calling, for example, the, the 1030 appointments, and then they all come on to a separate line, which is just that appointment line, and, there, and therefore everyone feels like they're treated fairly. And so the goal is you know, to make it, people safe in several ways, safe and healthy, and to also for them to be in a good mood in the sense that they felt like they were treated fairly because their experience and their perception of the event starts outside, not when they're getting the, the, the needle in the arm. And okay, we want this so, to be a good experience. Great, Frank. So, all right, so let me ask you the question again and incorporate that. I love that, that whole, it's all about safety, and it's not just your safety, it's everybody's safety. Um, and I love that whole, like, hey, why can't you just drive you? Maybe this person just doesn't think. you got pedestrians. This is Staten Island, right? The people are walking everywhere, and there are people walking to and from uh, and outside. So how about adding a little bit of that into your response. So I'm going to ask you the question again, Frank. Yes. Frank, I'm here. I, you know, I drove here. Why couldn't I just stay in the car? Why couldn't you guys just do a drive-through? Uh, well, uh, thank you, sir, for, uh, for coming. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I would normally ask for their appointment time. And mm -hmm. when they tell me that, I would then say, well, based on that appointment time, you could either wait in the car uh, for two hours, then come in five minutes, you know, before, or 30 minutes and wait, you know, and, and come in five minutes before. Or there's a spot right down the block where I know where there's parking, and you only have to walk about two or 300 feet. And that, that's the easiest way uh, to, to do that. The, uh, the harder part is we do get a lot of people who are infirm, and they need a lot of support the whole way through. So we try to accommodate and be mindful and supportive of their particular needs. Okay, so that's great. Now, audience, what do you think of that second answer? Um, I, and I think one of the great things you're doing is you, you, you bring it to, it's not just about them, and it's not just about you. You know, this is, you're thinking, you're trying to accommodate everybody. Again, safety is paramount, not just with the virus, but, the, you know, we can't neglect all the other things. Um, you know, those are powerful answers. So it's great, and again, it gives them confidence. It, Look, some people are never satisfied, but, you know, when you open them up to something that they didn't think about, maybe standing in line isn't such a big deal, right? I, I just want to say that, that by explaining to them why they're standing in line, we're doing it this way, everyone gets the idea, ah, that makes sense, and I'm not going to lose my slot. I'm going to be treated fairly. So the thing, me as a New Yorker, I really care about which is wasting my time, okay, <laughs> right. this, this person's, you know, empathetic and sympathetic, too. Yeah, no, I know, and I, and I, and I love it. Look, I, I've lived in New York City my whole life, and um, that, again, being relevant to your area, uh, saying, look, nobody wants to waste your time, nobody wants to waste my time, you know, like, I love it. You're, you're talking their language, uh, and, and that makes you much more credible, I think is what somebody said. Uh, so here's another question for you. So... Um, let's see, there's a question about uh, translators. Um, I, I don't know if you have translators there, but let's just say you do, and um, I'm bringing my uh, relative, my, my parents who don't speak English, and I'm a little annoyed that you don't have enough translators on staff, so now I have to wait even longer. So Frank, wh how come you guys didn't think of having more translators at this facility? Well, the first thing I would, is, okay, so my answer is is that I'm sorry that we don't have enough translators here. We're trying to staff this at the right level. I will let the management know today uh, in, in our daily report that we need more translators for, I'll make it up Russian, um, and we will try to get them here 
uh, tomorrow. I will I will report that, and we'll do our best to try to improve this. Okay. All right. So, audience, what do you think? What do you think of that response? And Frank, I know I put you on the spot. Uh, no, that's again, okay. I, great. These are all realistic. These are realistic yeah. questions. Yep. Well, audience, what do you think? You think um, there's something that he, he he maybe can add to that question to that answer? Do you think it was good as it is? Okay. So so Patrick here brings up a good point. He's like, you know, maybe you overpromised, right? Um, and maybe I'm, I'm thinking being skeptical, like I've heard that before. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I actually have an answer to that. So I'm aware. Uh, I, uh, so uh, we actually have a tool. There's a, uh, a, uh, a video uh, translation service that we can pull up on our iPads. I don't have the code for that now, but any of the any of the people online here who all have iPads would be able to get that up on that. I just need to make to to uh, get the information. So we might have it later today. I just I I'm under promising, and that we'll have it tomorrow. Well, it's a Patrick's point. So I, I think that maybe there is this uh, again. You know, this is just a kind of my reaction here. Is you know, look, I can't promise you that we'll do it. You know, or we can, but but you know, I'm glad that you've given us okay. that kind of feedback. Because here's what I'm thinking, Frank. So most people who complain, they want to be heard, right? Yes, they want something to change, but more importantly, they want to be heard. And when you put them at ease, there you can, you know, it, it, it's about being disarming. So it's like, you know, hey. We, we can definitely appreciate how this causes more, uh, you know, um, more of a weight for you. It's, it's more of a hassle and whatnot. Um, and while, to Patrick's point, well, maybe I can't, maybe we can't get, but your input is valuable. We, we're going to try our best. And if we don't, uh, just understand that, you know, we take everybody, you know, we respect everybody, blah, blah, blah. You, you know that more than I do. But um, that whole, like, setting that expectation a little bit lower, being a little bit more realistic and yet giving the value to the question. Does, does that make any sense? So, I, I, so what you're saying, I, I should have first uh, expressed uh, empathy and reception of their concern and then secondly sought to uh, address it. So signify that I've, I'm hearing their concern. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, first of all, I'm not saying that I know better than you do. I, that, Frank, I hope that does not come across. I am not trying to say that what you're doing, is, what you're saying is wrong. It's, it is not. You're doing an amazing job. And, uh, you know, this is me being a, a, an arm, uh, you know, armchair quarterback. That's all. So, please, I, I'm not saying anything. My suggestion is not just the empathy part. Uh, this, this, is done, uh, this is done very often. But give them a little credit, right? Uh, highlight like why it's important for people like them to speak up because as you're learning through this, people like them are the ones helping you become better. Exactly, and, exactly, and my, exactly. My thing is, this is it. This is we're not, you know, that Q and A change. You're not here to change their world, but when you give them credit, it is amazing. Like that demeanor, the the level of frustration, the anger, possibly actually will go down because it's like, oh, thank you for, you know, not just acknowledging me, but giving me credit. So, so Frank, let's, let's do this again. Hey, I'm here with my parents. They don't speak English. I, why don't you have more translators here? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, we don't have uh, enough right now. Uh, I, 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 we, we probably should have more. Uh, I'm going to take your suggestion uh, because it's an important one, and really you deserve to have your parents speak in their native tongue. So uh, I'm going to make an effort to make sure that gets recorded today and the things that we need to address and fix. I can't promise uh, that will get fixed tomorrow, but I'm glad you raised it because I'm sure other people will benefit from your you know, suggestion and this improvement. Thank you. That, Frank, that was, that was awesome. So, uh, audience, please. Uh, we, we, we just need some feedback on that. What do you think? Like, uh, Frank, I think, like, and I know, again, we, I know we put you on the spot, and this is just, you're, you're just kind of uh, making this up as you go along. You didn't promise me the world. You didn't say you were going to change it. 
I love that you leveled with it. You leveled with me. Um, you didn't just say words. You explained yourself, which to me had so much more value. So uh, let's let's look at this, some of this uh, um, the feedback from the audience here. See, validate the complaint. Thank you, Kathleen. That is the word that I was looking for. Validate. Yeah, same here. Yeah, yeah. That was the word people, I was trying to think of too. Yeah, people love to feel validated. Right? When, look, I know there are some complainers and you think that's all they like to do, but when you, when you validate their position, boy, does that disarm them. Then they say, Frank isn't someone who is going to fight me. Frank understands me because, hey, I think I, I'm bringing up an important issue. Frank just said I brought up an important issue. Now my defenses get a little bit lower. And the things that you have to say, I am now more likely to, to listen to you as opposed to you saying, hey, you know what, thanks for your suggestion, we're going to try. Well, that makes me sound like, okay, like going to McDonald's and, and, the, and the clerk saying, hey, thank you for coming to McDonald's. I don't think that person really cared I came to McDonald's. You know, they just said thank you because that's part of their, you know, script or what have you. Um, and, it, you know, when you, when you take an extra step to explain it, it, it makes it sound sincere and not robotic. Um, yeah, so I think I think there's some great comments here. I, I think people feel like it's it worked. Um, you know, great response, wonderful, and and this is for the audience and for you know for everybody. Look, uh, again, that that analogy, that that example of going to a uh, shop, and when people say thank you for shopping here, you know, I'm not saying that they're not sincere, but when you go to a small shop and someone says, hey, thank you, and and, and, you know, you're really helping my business out. You know, adding a few extra words, just, it's like, it's, it's an amazing thing. It, it, it snaps you out from that kind of, oh, automatic response. But this person mm. really is genuinely feeling something. Right, Frank? Right. That, that's, that, that's, that's a good point. Okay. Frank, you did, you did an awesome job. Look, I, and, and you're coming back in the second half. Um, so, so thank you very much. So I'm turning off the webcam right now, right? Yes. Turning off the web, okay? And I'm muting myself. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Um, and, and I'm sorry. You know what? And, and I think there was a question earlier, um, and it had something to do with uh, answers that can trigger people. I, and, I, and I apologize. Um, If the person who asked the question about triggering the questioner or triggering the uh, crowd can retype that, I, I, I'd love to address that. So, again, I apologize for uh, missing that. But uh, anyway, look, uh, so we're going to take a five-minute break here, please. Uh, I got another video. Um, I think you're going to find it really, really informative. So if everybody can come, uh, come back at, let's just say, uh, 2.56. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And Frank will be back in the second half as well. Okay, I stopped the broadcast. Oh. Hey, um, I'm probably, I'm going to drop for that other call. Evie's on the line, right? Yep, I'm here. All right. Um, so I'm going to drop to do that call with Russell, and then I'll come back in, um, you know, move on without me. When I'm back, I'll let you know I'm here. You know, even if I'm here and you've already started the questions, just, just keep going as if I'm not. Okay. Okay, Deb. And, and Deb, just so you know, I, I, I it's, it's going to end, you know, probably somewhere around that 3.30 range. Um, okay. So, so, you know, I could always buy time, but we'll have yeah, it. No, that, that, that's fine. You know, uh, Russell scheduled me for a meeting at 3 o'clock, and I was like, well, I already have something at 3 o'clock. Do you need me to be there? And he said, yes. Um, so I just have to, I have to get on this other call. It's with one of the equal rights bosses down at headquarters, you mm -hmm. know, about this whole equity messaging thing. Um, so, as usual, thank you. Professional, nice to see you in a jacket. You do clean up nicely. Um, <laughs> I'm wearing, wearing sweatpants uh, underneath, but that's all right. <laughs> hey, 
as long as it ain't boxer shorts, you know. Um, <laughs> nice to see that some men still believe in getting haircuts and a shave. <laughs> so uh, always appreciate um, your support, Thomas. Okay. Well, yeah. We, that, that, thank you. This has been great. But anyway, we'll 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 wait till you return because it's not a show without that. Oh goodness, yeah. I I do <laughs> love to be the center of attention. All right. I'll start with you guys later. All right. Uh, okay. So, uh, Allison, the other video will be um, uh, not this slide. One, two. It'll be the third slide so there'll be one okay. then another one and then the video and you'll and we'll have it with the uh, it's a picture like the other one okay okay um, I don't know what's uh, are we getting good uh, participation you think yeah I mean I feel like the chat there was a lot of activity um, with people providing feedback in there yeah, I was, uh, yeah. And then somebody oh. asked a question, and I feel so bad. Like, I, I couldn't find, I lost it in the chat. Yeah, what was it about, you said? Uh... Ah, how do you, it was Karen Gale. How do you prepare for the very uncomfortable questions that tend to trigger people? Oh, good, okay. she put it in the Q&A box, too. Oh, okay, Q&A box. Do you have a Q&A yeah, box? So... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Below the chat box, do you see there? There's like a question here for the presenter box. Ah, shit! I never even really looked at it. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there, people sometimes ask just like about the sound, but then they also ask about the content. So I marked, um, I think three in there for us to ask at the end. Okay. Um, okay. But yeah. Frank, you on? I think he went on mute. Yeah, okay. Who's drinking the water? Oh, Who's that's that me. Water? You're making <laughs> me want to go to the bathroom now. Great. I got like one minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting some water. I'm really thirsty. <laughs> Why don't you show pictures of a waterfall or something while you're at it, too? Yeah, I might as well do the full effect. <laughs> <laughs> And it was just 10 minutes for your part in total, and then we'll do the kind of the part with Frank so that we're done. Um, how, no, how I think Frank? about, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, <laughs> what, 15 I mean, I minutes? Can, I don't know. I can just set, like, you know, a 30-minute timer, which brings us close to that, like, 3.30 mark. Yeah, um, Okay. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that. Okay. I think I, I mean I think Frank's doing a great job, and so uh, we may want to um, keep this uh, keep this keep him a little bit longer. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Just take my own advice and prepare prepare a better plan hey. for you think Hey that. guys. So if if I can make a suggestion. You know, I, I've sort of given them a size up on on what it looks like. I'm sure they can imagine, but you know, they, they one of the things that certs are great at is uh, play acting. You know, on as victims or clientele or you know, and probably anyone else in emergency management's done this. Just you know, give me your best shot. You know, make it realistic. You know, not over the top, but you know, give me your best shot on questions. Yeah, yeah, no, in the second half, it's gonna, it, we're going to ask a little bit more difficult questions. And, and I think, so I have a video of somebody who kind of does the spinning, you know, he does a little spin 
Um, and uh, Frank, I think you're going to do a great job. And, uh, again, um, I hope I'm not telling. I, I'm not trying to say that what you're saying or your responses are bad. Not at, not at the very least. So. No, 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 no. I didn't. I didn't take that at all. I'll just say on the thing with the translator, we do have some standard responses to that. So the first one I gave was close to our standard response that we would have on oh, no, this. great. Yeah, you know, hey, scripts work, man. I mean, I've lived yeah. my whole life with scripts. I yeah. totally get it. And you, you, you sound, you're, you're, you're very good at what you do. You're, you're an excellent speaker. Um, so I'm glad that you volunteered. Thank, thank you. Okay. All right, I think we're going to begin in one moment. Okay, I'm going to uh, right. rebroadcast if you want to turn on your cam. Yep. Hey, Frank, yeah, mute yourself. Great, thank you. Okay. Muted. Great. Okay, I hope everybody is back. Um, so we're going to get into the second part, and we're going to get into the actual techniques of answering questions. And before I do that, I, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before, you know, as somebody who gets in front of a group and starts to talk to an audience who can be a wide range of people, I want you to all think about who these people are and, and where to the, kind of devote your energy. You know, and, and I think of an audience always as like a bell curve where you've got some people who are just your supporters. They bought in, and in fact, they're probably doing things to, to uh, further your message or your mission or your goals. And then you have your opposition group. You know, they just, they won't listen. They are vehemently opposed to what you have to say. They don't agree with you. And it's hard to get to, through to them. And, you know, those two ends, while they're very important and they do exist, I wouldn't spend so much time on them. First, the opposition, they will just suck your energy. They will take all your time, and you'll probably get very little out of it. Whereas your supporters, it's just an echo chamber. And the trap is they feel good. You know, you say things to them, and they agree. And, in fact, they will say good things about what you have to say, and it's just, a very nice feeling and it's a trap because you're not going to win them over anymore. So the core audience is those people in the middle, you know, they kind of care, they don't care, they're on the edge. It's, it's that group that we really need to speak to. So we need to move those people who are somewhat indifferent over to the interested side. Now, it's not always that easy. If we work on the way we present, you know, not just what we have to say, but how we say it, this combination can really make a huge, huge effect and can maybe move some of those people from one end to another, and hopefully some who are just interested into those supporters. So now, Karen, I want to get into your question because I have a video coming right after this slide. You know, those un uncomfortable questions. It's not that it's, it's, it is hard to prepare for those. You have to stand fast and believe in your message. What is it that you're trying to get across? And like I said before, kind of practice your messaging. You know, get it into a bite, a sound bite, something that whenever you're put in a tough spot, you kind of reach in your pocket and, and you can say. And you can say it not only in a credible way, but in a very confident way. It'll get you out of a lot of jams. It'll buy you time to, to think of the next thing to say. But most importantly, you know, you can't avoid the uncomfortable situations. You kind of have to take it head on. And, and here's, a, here's a great example. So let me cue up the next video. So this is a picture of uh, ex-Congressman Anthony, uh, Anthony Weiner. Uh, many of you New Yorkers may remember him. He was our congressman. He, there was a scandal where he sent some obscene photos. Eventually, he had to resign. A number of years later, he, make, he makes amends. He runs for the mayor of New York City. And he's actually winning or leading in the polls. And then it turns out that he never learned his lesson, and he gets caught in another scandal with some uh, obscene pictures. 
He is now at a town hall the day after the story breaks, okay, running for the mayor of New York. He gets introduced to the crowd. He gets maybe one or two applause, uh, just that courtesy. But you can tell that nobody likes him there. And then he gets asked a question by somebody who says, I'm not going to vote for you, or why should I vote for you, because you've lied to your wife or what have you. Allison, can you play the video? I just want everybody to listen to what he has to say I and his body. I did that. That was wrong. 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 And people have every right in the world to say that it disqualifies me. But I'm not going to quit based on that. And I'm a little curious. Why would you want me to? Amen. Why would you want me to? Is it the idea of why does giving someone, even if you've never voted for me? It, you know, I wonder sometimes, why are my opponents so eager for me to get out of the race? If they believe their ideas are better than mine, if they believe their record is better than mine, if they believe their character is better than mine, if they believe that overturning term limits over the views of the citizens mm -hmm. is better than what I do, then let them stand up And at a certain point, you've got to say, look, I don't quit. New Yorkers don't quit. I'm not going to go into the corner and curl up because someone found out something embarrassing about me. You see what's going on here today? If you become mayor of the city of New York, you've got to put up with this every single day. People saying to you, you know what? You did something we don't like. Cameras in your face, change your mind. Back down, quit. That's not the kind of mayor I'm going to be. Sir, I say to you with all due respect, if you don't like to vote for me, do not vote for me. But don't deny these people the right to vote for me. If they want What do you guys think? You think you think uh, Anthony Weiner did a good job in responding to that very uncomfortable question? And going back to that bell curve, notice he wasn't playing to the person or people who just weren't going to support him no matter what. He brought it back to his message. So Karen, think of his situation. That how uncomfortable it is is he that he made amends and he really kind of failed, uh, that he had to quit Congress, and now he has a scandal again. And Anthony, that's exactly right. He took ownership. Right, making lemonade from lemons. It is an impossible question to answer. You cannot win on that. How, it, there was nothing he can say that would have changed the mind of this person who asked him the question because Apparently, he didn't like him, didn't like what he did, et cetera. But, and one thing we're going to get into a little bit later, Anthony, he knew it wasn't just about him and the person asking the question. He has an audience. I want you to remember that. He gave up on this person. I don't need that one vote. But I can take this as an opportunity to maybe win over the other folks, win over other folks. Also, what does he say? I'm a New Yorker, right? This is Staten Island. We take, as being New York, you take pride in that. And when somebody says, hey, I'm a tough guy, I'm from New York, we all understand that. We all understand it, we respect it. We can align. And so he's hitting upon so many great points. And he's doing this on the fly. So he's obviously prepared because he knew he was going to be asked this very uncomfortable question. And he didn't want to take it head on, but he took ownership of it, and then he controlled it or brought it back to what he wanted to talk about. And so this goes about to being disarming. And we were touching upon that a little bit earlier in the first half. When people are difficult or, or are skeptical of what you have to say, you know, their kind of defenses are up. And for you, to someone who wants to persuade somebody to influence some action that, you know, at the end will only benefit the, that person, it's important that you have to get your points across. And so when people's defenses are up, they're less likely to take in what you have to say. So one of the great ways is disarming. And, you know, people often say, hey, that's a good question. You know, that's one thing. But as Frank, we went through with Frank's exercise, you validate 
their position, the fact that they're being vocal, it really does something to them. I, I was in a meeting once. It was a flood mapping meeting. There was a, basically a heckler, someone who was saying, oh, you know, FEMA promises this and fails to deliver on that. And I couldn't argue with him. He was disrupting the audience. He was disrupt, disrupting the presentation. But I gave him credit, saying that his frustration, people who are frustrated are the people who care. And I asked him, please give me the benefit of the doubt, at least until the end. And then we can have this, we can continue this conversation. But what I saw on his face, when I gave him that acknowledgement that, look, you obviously care, you're frustrated, and now you're speaking out, that does a lot. That did a lot for his kind of demeanor. And at the end of it, we kind of shook hands. We actually joked at the end of it, and we had a very good and productive conversation. Be disarming. Don't take it personal. Don't get emotional. And understand, take their energy, take their emotions. Grace it. Accept it. Give them credit for it. And then ask them. Just a little respect. Because if you give them respect, they're more likely to give you a little respect, which means they'll give you possibly an open mind to what you have to say. And having to say no to somebody or disagree with them, that becomes very, very, it can become very contentious. And so there are ways of saying no to somebody and yet still having it to be a very productive conversation or exchange. Now, William Urey, he's written a few books. He's uh, done a TED Talk, and he talks about negotiations. And one of the books he has is The Positive No. And, you know, all he says is that people don't want to hear no right away. Because just think of your position. Think of yourself. If you said something, somebody said, no, you're wrong, what happens? Get defensive. Right? You start digging in your heels. You may get angry. And there's no way, once somebody ticks you off or triggers you, that you're going to take anything they have to say, uh, be open-minded, or listen to them. And so in William Urey's uh, book, he talks about the positive no. Start with the yes. We're going to use the word validate once again. Validate that person's position. How do you do it? Explain it back to them. You're saying this because you care about your parents. You, you care about the community. Uh, you don't want to be inconvenienced. We all understand, you know, nobody wants to waste their time. But that's the yes. And then you provide your answer. And yet there are bigger things that we need to worry about for us in this pod. We need to worry about the other folks who need special assistance, the people who are walking on the street. When there's a lot of vehicles, it can be a safety issue. So you're kind of refuting what people have to say, but, right, but not being confrontational about it. And here's the kicker. You ended on a positive note with a yes. And so let's take your ideas. Well, how can we improve this? Let me write this down. Let me take what you have to say. Try to carry it forward. And this way, this person, while you just told them no, or you disagreed with them, what they had to say, it wasn't confrontational. It was starts out positive, you get your message across, and then you end on a positive note again. And this can be a strong way of working with people who are in opposition or disagree with what you have to say. And the only way to really be very good at being persuasive or answering questions properly, or, or taking full advantage of your, uh, of your audience's attention, you have to be a good listener. The great communicators are great listeners. And this is so important. And, you know, oftentimes when you hear people speaking, sometimes they're just really talking at each other, back and forth, without really listening or acknowledging the other, what the other person has to say. And that can be extremely, extremely frustrating. Listen to people. Restate what they just said. It is a powerful, powerful way of connecting. 
you cannot understand that effect. And I, if you have that opportunity, just try it. When somebody says something, just say, oh, let me see if I got this right. And if you can restate what they just said, maybe better than they did, you'll see, watch their facial expression. Watch their demeanor. They will be much more open to what you have to say because they now know you understand them. Can't do this without listening. Active listening, not hearing. Hearing is this passive thing. I hear the truck pass by. I hear my dog barking. Listening. Listen to the words. What are they trying to say? Get beyond just the words. What's the purpose or the motivation behind it? Once you get that, your answers can hit straight to the point, well beyond what is just being asked, but what is what they're feeling or what the position is. Once you can tap into that, boy, can your message resonate. The other thing we touched upon earlier was the whole kind of the robotic thank you or uh, you're right, and then getting on to your point. Try to be a little bit more descriptive when you can. And when you do, it is amazing. Because I just had this the other day. I asked a question, and it was during a webinar, and somebody said, not only validated what I had, to, the question I had, but gave it credit, right? They, they said it was a great question because a lot of people have asked this before. Those extra words made it from the, hey, good question, which just sounds very robotic, to, wow, this person really just thinks that my question was good. Now, I'm not sure if it really was the case, but at that moment, that instance, I felt good about asking that question. And so now that I felt so good and this person acknowledged that I had a good question, I listened intently, even more so than I probably would have, to the answer that they provided. It doesn't take a lot of effort. Explain why it was a good question. Give them credit. Acknowledge. Validate. All these words. It, these are feelings. When people feel good about themselves, that can go a long way for them to, to listen to you, be moved by you. And just like the town hall that Anthony Weiner was uh, uh, addressing, remember, you're not alone. So in Frank's situation, he's probably working a line where he's in an area that's full of people. And when people are asking questions, well, you know what? Other people are probably listening in. So you have the opportunity not only to address the questioner, but to address the crowd. And so when there are uncomfortable situations or that no-win scenario, sometimes you just got to make the best of it. Win the audience, lose the questioner. And people will see how you react. So don't forget, you as a speaker, you're on stage, you're in front of a room, you're on a webinar. People are watching you react to others. And if you want to win over the crowd, you need to treat everyone with respect. But as you, uh, when you have somebody who asks you those questions, the way you treat them, People will take note. And if you do a good job, then the, you have a good body language, you say the right words, you have the right delivery, that will win over an audience as well. So we're going back to the four ways of answering any question, right? You can respond, refer, reflect, or redirect. And redirect is the hardest uh, of, the, of the four. So we're going to get into a little details. Uh, we're going to get into the details of every one of these. So the direct response, like in Frank's scenario, people ask you a question, you just answer them. But don't belabor the point. Don't go into another lecture. I've seen that happen. We've all been there, and I start to roll. Right? Get, address the question. Give one reason. Give them an example, and then bring it back to your message. Why is it so important that you are out there that you are up there speaking to people? What's your mission? Right? What do you want people to learn or get out of your talk? 
bring it back in one form or another. And when you have uh, those messaging, uh, those talking points already practiced, it's so easy to just bring it right back in. But again, get to the point. Don't waste people's time and don't use it as an opportunity to, to go into another discussion or go down a rabbit hole. Now the refer and deflect, maybe it's something that you can't answer. Hey, I will get somebody to, uh, you know, I'll get you in touch with somebody else or I'll come back with this information. I don't have it. Don't make it up. Just tell them you'll, you'll follow up. People will appreciate that. And then finally, we talk about that no-win situation, those uncomfortable questions, right, Karen, that, that sometimes people can ask you. And we can't avoid it. And in fact, we shouldn't. Because if it is a big issue, right, the elephant in the room, we need to address it because nobody will be satisfied unless you take on the tough or the big issues for that area, that audience. And so the, the, the strategy here is don't try to win the unwinnable. Make the most of it. And that's why those talking points are so, so important. You're not alone. You can lose the battle, still win the war. And you have to make that decision while you're there. And it, it's, not that, um, it's not as hard as you think it is, but you have to be cognizant. You have to keep that in the back of your mind. And here's an, uh, the anatomy of, of answering those tough questions. And it's kind of like the yes, no, yes sandwich. Right? You acknowledge, you validate that person's uh, question. You're asking this question because you care, you do this, you do that. that. Bring that bridge and watch the word but. When you use the word but, sometimes people will think, okay, here's the but. Sometimes you can use a pause. Sometimes you can use the word and. And then bring in your point. And then come back to your message. And if you can, make it a positive one, how we can all work together. If somebody is directly opposes what you have to say, at the end, how do we find that common ground? How do I learn from what you believe? That will go a long way, not only to tamper down any of the animosity or anger, but to actually bring somebody to, to the table and wanting to talk or, or actually help assist you strengthen your point or your message. And so that's the re redirecting. When you, when you get asked that difficult question, like uh, Mr. Wiener's uh, position when he was in Staten Island running for mayor, here are some example phrases. You know, that's a quest great question many people have. Yeah, those little extra words. You know, that's a great question. We've all heard that. But can you imagine, hey, that's a great question. You're tapping into what people feel, what, other, what your neighbors feel. Boy, those extra words can go such, such a long way. The key is to have your messaging, your, your talking points ready for whatever the situation. When you can bring it back, you're ending on your note. You're ending on a positive or a powerful note to help you reiterate what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so we're going to bring Frank back. Um, I'm sorry, was there, I forget, was there a question that came in? Uh, let's see here. Okay, Michelle Green, uh, your comment. Yes, so definitely, and, and, and Michelle, that was a great comment. Thank you very much for that feedback. She, she wrote, mistakes and setbacks do not negate a strong platform or a constituent-focused bait plan of action. And I think that constituent focus, that's a very key word, right? Powerful. It's I'm here talking to you as an audience. I don't have an agenda. My agenda is your, is your safety or it is constituent focus. And it becomes harder for them to be angry or upset. Not saying impossible, but it is, their, it is for their benefit that you're doing this talk or you're trying to uh, persuade people to take action. And when they ask you these questions, whether it's uncomfortable or straightforward, you're gaining that insight. 
did I miss something? Is there something important in this audience or this community that I'm learning from this question so that I can tweak my talking points? Right? I can tweak that message so that it resonates, it is relevant. Because we've all been there. If you say something that kind of goes over somebody's head or it's just not something that's important to them, you're never going to win them over. Okay, so we got you, Frank. Frank, are you still on? Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you, Frank. Great. Okay. So, so for this instance, um, I want the, the audience to really think of a really difficult question to ask Frank. And it can be an impossible question, right? Think of those questions that, uh, you know, really get creative here. We're going to put Frank on this spot, and, and I think Frank is someone who can definitely handle it. So you're there, you get to the pod, and you are the audience, you're somebody who is upset or whatever, throw it at Frank, please put it in the chat, uh, the chat box. And Frank, I'm going to start while people are thinking the questions. So Frank, this probably happens a lot. I come, I don't have an appointment. Wait a minute, I'm somebody who really needs this vaccine. Why can't you see me now, Frank? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, what I, uh, what what happens is that uh, we don't have uh, uh, walk-ins. Uh, you have to have an appointment. One of the things I have heard, though, uh, is that you can come back around four or five o'clock, and if there are some extra vaccines, uh, then we might know. So I would say check back around four or five. Um, but there's just. On a day like today, I would say it's probably not, but maybe uh, tomorrow or later in the week you might f find that. The best way, though, is to make an appointment, and one of my colleagues over here uh, can help you with that. You see the man in the blue shirt or the blue vest? He would be able to help you with that appointment. Excellent. Thanks, Frank. All right, audience, what do you think? Uh, very direct response. I like it. Full of information. What does the audience think? So please use the chat box. And uh, Allison, if you can just take a note of Joanna's question, we'll use that one next. So Frank, again, very much to the point. Now, what I would say, again, as just being an outside observer and an armchair, armchair quarterback, is you used a lot of, you made sense, right, Frank? You made sense. But sometimes we see that people who kind of disregard the rules or don't take the effort, uh, sometimes are not as rational. Do you, do you ever have that happen? Yeah, but I think, I think your approach on this is because you're interacting with the public is to try to sort of win them over. The goal is to really be understanding of they're upset. Okay, and for valid reasons, okay, and maybe they don't mm -hmm. act rationally, but to try to listen to what you can tease out of it and maybe what you can do for them, and if you can convey, you know, empathy and support, you know, in the psychological first aid, you know, kind of sense, then, you know, that, that's a good step towards bridging the communication with them, and then you're on to figuring out, you know, what you can do to help them. Yeah, and, and I think Maria just really touched upon that when she said, you know, you gave him a straight answer. You also gave him an alternative. And I think, uh, you know, Patrick said the same thing. I mean, you're, you're, you're addressing the, this person's concern, uh, and you give him an alternative. And, and I'm wondering, though, you know, one of the other things that uh, maybe can be helpful is you've got to kind of make that person – there, there's, a, there's a strategy in negotiation where if you're negotiating with another person, it becomes you versus them. But if you try to get them to, ex to kind of look at it outside their own position, now it becomes two versus that person. In other words, it's like, you know, uh, and not so uh, bluntly said, but it's, you know, how would you like me to handle this? The thing is, this person has to understand that if they were somebody waiting for it uh, that had an appointment and was waiting, and then somebody cut them in line, sir, how would you feel, right? Or try to put them in a position of how would they like it if they were even more inconvenienced or they missed out on a vaccine because somebody who didn't follow the rules, right? And, again, I don't right. know what that fine balance is, 
but it's one of those things that it's a, it's a, it's a negotiation strategy where, again, you got to get them, you got to get them to answer, put them in a position uh, by asking them a question of putting, uh, of, of thinking like, how is it that they want me to do this? Like, sir, how do you want me to give you a vaccine right now? Do you want me to put you in the front of the line? Right? You know, and, and all of a sudden it becomes this thing, like it's an, almost an impossible question for them to answer. They're not ready for it. And, and sometimes, you know, that can kind of win them over or have them see your point. I, I don't I'm, know actually, I'm, I'm actually using your strategy. So what, in, in, in answering that question to the person, typically I'm answering it in a normal tone of voice. And right. there are other people who might be hearing that. So what they need to hear is consistent policy, you know, yeah. and, and fairness. And, and so what I gave them is, you know, what we're, you know, uh, trained in, you know, what the message of the day is in terms of getting that out. Um, they would also understand in the same way that if they're looking to cut ahead of the line, well, you know, I got a hundred other people around here who are not going to be happy with that. There's, so there's going to be some social pressure that I don't think they're going to attempt to do that. And if they attempt to do that, well, then that goes and and then they either get physical or start, you know, raising their voice or whatever. Well, then that's you saw in the first slide. You know, that's why NYPD's here or school safety. I I don't. There's a stop. There's a point where I stop engaging. You know, and just you know reach for help. Then at that point. No, no, I, it, Frank. I, I think I think your answer was a great answer. So, um, you know, it, it's it's smart, and uh, I, I love it that you know you you got the social pressure right. That's a big thing, right? People, you know, we're not as individualistic as we think we are. We feel self conscious. Everybody feels self conscious, and and if you let them win over the crowd, that's a big. That's going to make your life a lot harder. And it shouldn't because there's nothing that you, Frank, or anybody else in that facility is doing to better yourself, right? You're not enriching yourself. You're doing a great service for the community. So, uh, you know, that's something that I think people, you already have that edge. But like you said, you know, social pressure is a big thing. So, no, I, I think that's great. I, I, was there, were there any other comments from the, from the audience here? Um, okay, so Christine says, you know, the possibility of vaccine, uh, being available at four is too uncertain. So, uh, you know, I think before we were talking about being honest and straightforward. What what if you said, you know, you can try it for it's, it's pretty hard. Your your better chances to do well, one. I, I've had that question today. So okay. I I so uh, I they they said so what should I do? I said well it's you know it's up to you. If you want to come back uh, today at four or five or tomorrow. Tomorrow at four or five, you know that's a choice. I can't guarantee anything, and today I don't think it's going to be likely, but maybe tomorrow uh, might have a better, uh, you know, likelihood. Still, I can't guarantee anything, and the best way is to uh, get an appointment. Uh, can I take you over to one of the people here to help you get an appointment? Yeah. So, so I love that part, right? That that finishing positive note that is great, right? I, I mean, you know, if if anybody says, well, no, I want to go now. I think, like you said, anybody listening in will say, well, what's wrong with this person? Uh, Frank just offered to help, right? And and that is that 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 was great. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. A group? Anybody? Anybody else? Anything else to say about this, that answer? Frank, I think that was, that was awesome. Well, we do. I'm just telling you, this is what we do. And, 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 it's, and overall, the public, including, you know, of, of a variety of perceptions, seems to be happy with that because the key thing is everyone is being treated fairly. And I think if you see a consistent fairness on that, that the public sees, then you can ask them to do the things that, you know, you want them to do, like keep six feet apart, and I need to move you here because, you know, that's uh, that's the ordering of the line. We're going in time order, you know, so everyone's treated fairly. Yeah, no, and that is exactly right, uh, the, the fairness. And sometimes it has to be said or sometimes it has to be implied. But like you said, with the, with the, the folks who are listening in, I mean, who can argue against being fair? Right there, there is right. just no argument. It's fair. Is fair is fair. Uh, to Patrick's point, he says, like you know, it's very similar to I can't do that, but I, what I can do. 
Uh, and again, ending on that positive note, you could have not said, you could have just said, hey, you can try again tomorrow, you can try this, or you can try to register for an appointment and end there. But that may not be satisfactory. The fact that you said, can I assist you or can I walk you to this, that offer is such, you end on such a positive note that it is, um, that is an excellent, excellent reaction. So, well, if, if, if you have the time for it, because you know, sometimes things get more crowded and you don't have the time, but if you have the time for it, I generally approach it as I keep offering assistance until you don't need any more assistance, okay, until I say, can I help you any further, and they say no, and then... Yeah, no, yep. go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, and that's, I mean, obviously there are times when it's really crowded where you sort of only get one or two questions, but many times when people say, I, I, you know, I have a question for you, I said, I'll give you ten questions, you know, and they only ask one or two, but, you know, it's clear you're open to, you know, open-minded to helping them, and everyone else hears your attitude, and they also see us asserts, you know, uh, you know, someone needs a steady arm to cross a curb, you know, uh, someone who's, you know, having difficulty walking, they want to hold on to her arm or whatever. It's like, that's okay. Um, but they see, or we get a chair for someone who who's, has difficulty, so they need to wait a while. They see that we're, we're acting kindly, you know, to everyone. So I, I think they give us the benefit of the doubt in terms of the interactions. That, no, that, that's absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, okay, so we got a question from Joanna. So uh, her question is, all right, so I'm in line. I, I'm diabetic. I just heard someone in line say that diabetics have really bad reactions to this vaccine. Who can I talk to about this? Uh, well, I'm glad you told me that, okay, because uh, I understand uh, uh, diabetes is important. Let me go get a screener right now. I'm not qualified to answer those questions, but I'm. But there's a person over there with a green shirt. I'm going to grab them. Uh, they they do the screening. They can answer some of your medical questions, and I'll get you an answer right away. I understand it's important. Great, great. All right, group. What do you think? What do you think of that answer? Um, do you think he hit all the points? Uh, and again, Frank, I think I feel like you you kind of went that extra step. Um, and again, it, it's it just it, it's not like a canned response. I think what I hear is, wow, Frank heard what I had to say. He understands me. And now that he understands me, well, maybe he has something actually helpful or useful or relevant, right? So, I, and I think you're getting uh, some responses here. Perfect. You, you know, uh, you let her stay in line, offer assistance. I love that, right? Hey, I don't want you to lose your place in line. Let me go get somebody else. Again, you're thinking about them, but not only are you saying it, but you're, you're demonstrating it, right? You can say, hey, I think, you're imp I think uh, you being here is important. All right, that doesn't mean anything. It's, those are just words. I think you being here important. I don't want you to lose your place online. Let me go get, let me see if I can get somebody right now. That is a demonstration of what you're trying to get across. You made somebody feel important or valuable. That will go a long way. Yes, yeah, certs are uh, certs are trained to, to to have that kind of listening ear. Yeah, no, no. Both on med right. medical, medical and psychological. Uh, you know, did you might need interventions. We have people that we know we can pull on right away. You know, on site to to bring immediate uh, assistance. No, and, and that's that's perfect, Frank. So, uh, if any, anybody have any more questions for Frank, anything that you want to put out there. Uh, Jennifer, I see your question. I'm gonna, I'll answer it after we're done when we, when we wrap up. I, if okay. I can say, I see, I see Gail's question there. You know, we've had some that require immediate assistance. Um, it, it, I would say depending upon the circumstance, um, in some cases we would pull them off the line to address their most immediate need. In some cases their immediate need might be uh, to be away from a crowd or to have a quiet place or something like that. You know, and, and then I'd be, like I said, there's people here who wear certain shirts that, you know, we, we go get them and provide an immediate referral, you know, on that. No, that, that's yep. great, Frank. And Frank, uh, I think a, a few people here have already said this, and let me say this myself. Thank you for your service. Thank you for, for doing this. Um, uh, 
I think, you know, um, I have two parents who are in their late 80s and who are worried and who are scared. And I think that if they came here and they saw someone like yourself and they had the ability to either hear you treat other people or be treated or be helped by uh, someone like you, um, that would do an amazing, that would make them feel so much more comfortable. So, Frank, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and I just want to say, you know, us certs are like this. We like interacting with the community. You know, for us, you know, uh, just when you're able to handle a situation like that, um, you know, that's what makes your day. That's what makes it all worth it, you know, the, the ability to serve, you know, others and be supportive. No, Those are the great, great moments. That's great. Thank you, Frank. Um, okay. So, Frank, if you don't mind, uh, if you can just turn your webcam off. Just give me a second. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. And so now I just want to address, so Jennifer, you had a question. Um, so how long, is it, how long does it think and provide an answer? You know, sometimes people ask you a question, they stump you. It happens. Sometimes you need more time. Uh, when you do, when you're in that situation, again, repeat the question. But sometimes really think about that question and, and ask them. Let me, have, let me get a, a 30 seconds or maybe a little time to really think about your question. Come back and really think about it. And, and if you can rephrase their question in your own words, or you can do it better than they ask them themselves. Not only do you kind of connect with the person asking the question, but as you start thinking about it, your, the answer may come up. So don't ever hesitate to ask for some time to think about it. You know, uh, sometimes when you're, when you're up in a, a stage or up in the front of a room, um, the silence becomes very, very awkward. And nobody wants 30 seconds, feels like three hours. But that's okay, as long as you explain yourself. It's an interesting question or it's an important question to ask. Uh, it, uh, right now, I just really need to think about it. And let me just think, so you're asking this and then rephrase it, buy yourself some more time use the opportunity to connect with the person asking you the question. And in that thought process, maybe that answer will come. And if you can't come up with a good answer, don't just wing it. Hey, you know what? I'm going to have to get back to you. Give me an email address or give me a phone number or something. Uh, if you find yourself in that situation, just be honest with people. People will respect it. They may not like it. They may be disappointed. But they will always respect honesty. If you go and you give them a poor answer or something that really misses the mark, what you do is you kind of undermine everything. So, um, and after that, so does anybody have anybody else have any questions in the chat box? Please feel free to ask. We're we're going to conclude this session. As um, as Deborah said earlier, this was the last of the three kind of sessions we had on public speaking. Um, I really enjoy doing this. Uh, I've gotten some nice feedback from, from some of you. Uh, I really appreciate it. You know, one of the things that I truly enjoy about this is I was a shy kid. I was a shy adult. And it, didn't, it took a lot for me to get out of my shell. But once I did, I can tell you that I never looked back. And so when I do these presentations, when I do in-person meetings, I, I, I got to tell you, I feel like I've accomplished something. But more importantly, for people who may be hesitant, you can do it. And it's not just about being a good speaker. You've learned a lot about yourself. And so really, sometimes you just need to get out of your comfort zone and just work through something. Try it. It's never as bad as you think, as bad as you think it's going to be. Right? We often think of the worst possible things that can happen for you to speak in front of a crowd where everybody's staring at you. Everybody is listening to you. You want to say the perfect thing. Well, guess what? There is no, sometimes there is no perfect thing. You can make mistakes. Everybody will understand. So please, uh, I, if, if nothing else, just try something. I don't care if it's something you hear here or you heard somewhere else or some TED Talk. When you see somebody who you're like, wow, that's a great, you know, uh, they said something great or the way they present, emulate them. Try it. You'll be surprised how much you can gain from that. 
once you become comfortable, you can move even further and further down the realm, uh, down the spectrum. So um, it's one of those things where people say, well, you know, how, how do I sound confident? Or they think that they need to be confident to sound confident. It's actually the other way around. Work on sounding confident. You'll be surprised how what that changes inside of you. So that's just my personal thing. Um, I don't see any more stories. Uh, I'm sorry, any more questions. So let me just wrap up. Here are the three points. Look, when people ask you a question, try to think beyond what is being asked. You know, what is the core issue at stake? If you can figure that out and you can address it, it will be a much more powerful way of getting your message across, right? Answering the question. And if it's just a straightforward question, take that opportunity to reinforce your message. Bring it back your talking points. When people are asking questions, they're opening up to you and saying, hey, I want to learn more or I want to hear more. They, have, they are in a different state of mind. And so it is a prime time to bring back or reiterate some of your points that you're trying to get across. And finally, when you're out in front of a group or an audience, or you're on working a line like Frank is, remember, you're not alone. It is just not an exchange between you and the person asking the question. You are addressing everybody. So make the most of all situations. Be honest with people. Be sincere. Don't feel like you have to be a hero or you have to know everything. Work, uh, just be yourself. Let them know it. People will appreciate it. People will respect it. Um, one question. So, Catherine, there was a question. How can these responses techniques be applied to print? You know, writing and speaking are two different things. I, I, write, you know, liter when, when things are in email and text messages are dangerous, they're much, much more difficult. Uh, Catherine, I don't really have a very good answer to that. I'm a, not a very good writer. I'm a better speaker than a writer. I'm sorry, I don't. But you know what? My email address is in the final slide. Um, I would love to discuss this more because I'm always looking to become a better writer. And if this is something that, uh, you know, maybe I could pass along to somebody, I, I, I would like to learn myself. So if you think of it or if you want, oh, sorry, I don't have an email address. but. I could give you my email address, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll let's definitely connect because I, I kind of I'm a little interested as well. All right, so thank you very much, um, Deb or Allison. You want to take us home? Sure. Um, thank you, Thomas, Frank, and everyone for joining us today. Uh, lots of great comments for you both in the chat box. Um, you can download the presentation slides in the pod to the left of the question answer box. Also, please take some time to answer a few brief questions about our webinar today. You'll see a three-question poll pop up on your screen in a couple of minutes. Let's get started. And also, please join us for our upcoming webinars. So on March 1st, we'll have English and Spanish deliveries of COVID-19 basics. Uh, we will also have English and Spanish deliveries of a webinar on developing um, preparedness for people with disabilities. And if you joined us on a broadband webinar we had a couple weeks ago, we'll have part two on March 4th. We'll have more webinars on keeping and maintaining a healthy meal plan during emergencies, and also Houses of Worship can attend New Jersey's Virtual Houses of Worship Security Program on March 18th and the 25th. The registration links are on your screen. There are some more webinars, and I'd also like to highlight that FEMA is accepting new applications for our Youth Preparedness Council. So if you have, if you know of any 8th to 11th graders who are interested in preparedness, uh, the application is due on March 7th. It just involves a few questions, and you can share the, the flyer on the screen with those students. So thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you on our future